from Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Millicent Walker. Good evening. Tonight, the All Progressives Congress kicks off its campaign in Benin City ahead of the September 19 governorship election in Edo State. War of words as the APC and PDP trade blame over the crisis in the Edo State House of Assembly. Youths from southern Kaduna take to the streets to protest killings in their area, say efforts of security personnel not good enough. And protesters in Beirut forced their way into foreign ministry as anger mount over Tuesday's explosion that left at least 158 dead. Plus, we have business and sports. On business news tonight, Central Bank debit 600 billion Naira from banks within the week for breaching its cash reserves requirement. And on sports news tonight, Serie A Giants Juventus FC named club legend Andrea Pirlo manager hours after sacking Maurizio Sarri. It's politics all the way, and in the center of it all is Edo State, where the All Progressives Congress today flagged off its campaign ahead of the governorship in the state on September the 19th. Then the war of words between the APC and the PDP as a fallout of the crisis in the Edo State House of Assembly and the takeover of the assembly complex by security operatives. But let's begin with the campaign, which is about to get more interesting as the APC flagged off its rallies in Benin City, the state capital today, where the party leaders expressed confidence in the ability of the APC to emerge victorious in the governorship poll. The first port of call is the Arbus Palace. The APC team arrives for the blessings of the Arbus. Up next is the sports complex of the University of Benin. An excited team welcomes them as well. Then it's straight to the business of the day as the APC leaders address the gathering. First is the chairman of the APC National Caretaker Committee, Governor May Malabuni. When lenity and cruelty play for a kingdom, the gentlest game star is the winner. We are here to win yes, yes. and not to fight at all. But we must ensure that every vote must count. The Kano State Governor, Abdullahi Ganduje, believes that the recent events at the State House of Assembly will work in the APC's favor. From the crowd we have seen, we have to conclude that this election will be won by APC. While their do APC governorship candidate, Pastor Saige Izeyamu, is confident of victory in the upcoming poll, the former APC national chairman, Comrade Adams of Shomole, does not want the incumbent governor back in office. With the people you have seen with me today, can anybody say we are in opposition? No. Can anybody say that we'll be intimidated? No. Who going to win the election? Sake is a yamu. Who going to win the election? Sake is a yamu. I want to assure them that in this election, we will not only win, we will win the 18 local governments. Am uh -huh. I speaking for the 18 local governments? Yes. Never again should we have a governor who will describe a dead youth as miscreant. Never again. Do we have miscreant in this state? No. I'm not doing it business. is the business of governors and of government to empower the poor and elevate them 
to a position of dignity. The event comes to an end with a symbolic handing over of the APC flag to its candidate, who the party believes will come out victorious in the September 19th governorship poll. Bye bye to you. Yes, sir. <laughs> Meanwhile, the All Progressives Congress national leader, Senator Bola Tinubu, is weighing into the crisis rocking the Edo State House of Assembly, describing the actions of the state government following the takeover of the assembly complex by security operatives as an assault on constitutional democracy and rule of law. In a statement he personally signed, Senator Tinubu accused Governor Godwin Obaseki of resorting to what he described as strong arm tactics of dictators after allegedly blocking the inauguration of two-thirds of the elected members of the state's assembly. He said that the governor merely brought in sand and gravels to block the entrance to the assembly complex to prevent lawmakers from gaining access to the facility. In the words of the APC leader, this is a cowardly act and a move to thwart representative democracy in Edo. No renovation has been planned for the state house building. No appropriation was made in the state's budget. The only reason any renovation could be deemed necessary is the destruction wrought by his own goons. According to Senator Tinubu, Governor Basaki has placed himself above the people who are represented in the legislature. In the meantime, the leadership of the PDP in Edo State has criticized the national leader of the APC, Bola Tinubu, for those comments he made against Governor Basaki. Now, the party turned the tables on Mr. Tinubu, alleging that he is the one behind the latest crisis at the Edo State House of Assembly. It doesn't make any sense for Asiwaju Bola Tinubu to sit down in the comfort of his home, drawing up impeachable uh, uh, grounds, ground, drawing up grounds for impeachment for the elected governor of Edo State. Le reading through his statement, I have come to a conclusion that certainly is not aware of the issues concerning the unfortunate uh, incident at uh, the State House of Assembly. It is proper to say here that we only have 10 members of the State House of Assembly today who are legally representing their various constituencies. I should expect, as a former governor of Lagos State, he should know better that once a proclamation is made by the governor of a state, the law does not allow him to make a second proclamation. The governor made a proclamation for the house, and uh, after that event, only 10, about 10 members turned out to take their oath of uh, office. The other 14 members, stayed away from the house. The PDP leader spoke at a press briefing in Benin City, the state capital, where the deputy governor, Philip Shaibu, also made allegations of a plot to assassinate high-profile personalities in the state. We have intelligence that uh, some individuals uh, are in a due state and their assignment is to come and assassinate some known individuals in the state. So I'm hereby bringing to the notice of the general public that these people are in town and we've communicated to the security agencies about the activities and why they are in town. And also to use this medium to call on Mr. President to also call the security to do their work. Because Edo people, and Edo is not going to be a theater of war if these things are dealt with. And for us, we will continue to appeal to our, our people not to look for trouble, not to disrupt any program. We are law abiding. We have the duty to protect lives and property. That we will continue to do. 
Well, staying with the intrigues of the Edo politics, the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Abubakar Malami, has written to the Inspector General of Police asking him to provide security for 17 Edo lawmakers who are backing the APC candidate in the upcoming governorship election in the state. Now, 14 of the 17 lawmakers were recently sworn in a private residence where they purportedly impeached the House Speaker and his deputy. In a memo dated the 3rd of August 2020, Mr Malami stated that his demand was in response to a request by the lawyers to the 17 members-elect of the House of Assembly who were allegedly prevented from being inaugurated on June 17, 2019. The lawyers also requested that the affected members should not be prevented from discharging their constitutional duties. Mr Malami states that in order to ensure compliance with the constitution and avoid a breakdown of law and order, the IGP should provide adequate security for the members and subsequent sitting of the House of Assembly. But the leadership of the PDP is not taking Mr Malami's move lightly. The party has described the directives as reckless and a nullity as it calls on the Inspector General of Police to disregard it in enti its entirety. Speaking at a news conference in Abuja, the spokesperson of the PDP Campaign Council, Mr Kola Ologbodino, insists that it is illegal for the Attorney General of the Federation to direct the Inspector General of Police to provide security for the factional principal officers of the Edo State House of Assembly. The People's Democratic Party says the directive by the Attorney General of the Federation, Abubakar Malami, to the Inspector General of Police to provide security for certain individuals parading themselves as members elect of the Edo House of Assembly is a thoughtless unconstitutionality, and to that effect, it is null and void. Our party says nothing in section 90, 91, 101, and 104 of the 1999 constitution as amended, cited by the Attorney General Malami, empowers him to go to the streets of any part of our nation to assemble some clowns and declare them members elect of any House of Assembly without electoral mandate. Perhaps the Attorney General should be made aware that the said individuals have been absent for 180 days, during which they abandoned their mandate and for which their seats had, were declared vacant in line with the rules of the legislature and according to the laws of this country. It is rather unfortunate for the Attorney General of the Federation to ask the IGP to provide security for impostors. That directive in itself is reckless. A party therefore charges the Inspector General of Police to disregard this misguided partisan directive by the Attorney General, as well as ask him to ensure that the police is not entangled in such a partisan agenda against the people of the state. And more reactions trailing the Edo Assembly crisis. The former Deputy President of Senate, Mr. E.K. Kweramado, has been speaking on the crisis rocking the Assembly, describing it as an embarrassment to the nation's democracy. According to him, the people of Edo State should be left alone to elect their leaders. The people should be allowed to decide who their leader should be. And that's why the difference between democracy and other forms of government. So the issue of this uh, attitude of bringing in talks, bringing security men to come and determine the will of the people is uh, anti-democracy. So I uh, cannot support that, that kind of attitude. So I want to appeal to all the players in the, in the those states, both PDP, NDC and other political parties, to give this a chance, allow the good people of those states to elect their leaders. Unless we do that, we are, we are yeah, undermining the whole yeah. democracy, and that's yeah, how democracy yeah. dies. So I believe yeah, that the law enforcement yeah. agencies, the INEC, the judiciary, yeah, these yeah. are critical uh, institutions of democracy. They need to cooperate in order to make sure that we we'll have a seamless election in the state and other states. We will have us to the election. 
Away from Edo State, but still on politics, ahead of the 2023 general elections, Governor Nasser El Rufai of Kaduna State is advocating that the South should produce the next president of the country after the end of President Muhammadu Buhari's tenure. In an interview he granted to the BBC House of Service and monitored in Kaduna, Governor El Rufai emphasized that he will not support a northerner to succeed President Buhari in 2023, noting that the idea of rotating the presidency between between the North and South may not be constitutional. Governor Al Rafai says that the idea is based on the country's political arrangement, which is aimed at promoting equity and fairness. In his words, in Nigerian politics, there is a system of rotation in which everyone agrees that if the North rules for eight years, the South will rule for eight years. That is why I came out and said that after President Buhari has been in office for eight years, no Northerner should run for office. Let the Southerners also have eight years. He also clears the air on his rumored presidential ambition in 2023, which he describes as baseless, insisting that he is not nursing any such ambition. In part two after the break, the People's Democratic Party holds congresses in some states across the country. Please join us again. Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on Channels Television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. The All Progressives Congress kicks off its campaign in Benin City ahead of the September 19th governorship election in Edo State. War of words as the APC and PDP trade blame over the crisis in the Edo State House of Assembly. Youths from southern Kaduna take to the streets to protest killings in their area, say efforts of security personnel not good enough. And protesters in Beirut forced their way into foreign ministry as anger mounts over Tuesday's explosion that left at least 158 dead. Our website, channelstv.com, has more information on our top stories and others. Subscribe and watch Channels Television's live stream on YouTube and other social media platforms using your mobile device browser or download the Channels TV app for Android iOS devices from their respective stores. You can also watch us via your smart TV platforms, Apple TV, Android Fire and Roku TV. More on politics now. The PDP has held its Congress in some states ahead of the 2023 general elections. In Delta State, Governor Ifai Okawa reaffirmed the strength of the party in its drive for consensus building and peaceful resolution of issues. Governor Okawa was speaking after casting his vote at the State Congress of the party in Asaba, where he asked members not to be distracted by the antics of the opposition in the state ahead of the 2023 election. Our strength is in our collective will. Standing individually, we may not have the political strength. But because you are there in the various units, because you are there in the various wards, because you are there in the various local governments, we have a state that we control. And today, by the grace of God and through your hands and your efforts, we control this state in all aspects, both at the state government level, the governor and the deputy governor. When it comes to the National Assembly, the State House of, uh, the state house of Assemblies, the local government councils, we are firmly in control. That is because we work committedly with one heart. And I want to urge us and to pray that we continue in that step. Because when we work with one mind, committedly, we will continue to ensure that we win in all elections in this state. And in the southeastern state of Ebony, the exercise was conducted at the Pa Ngedo Ruta Township Stadium, Abakaleke, the state capital, where over 1,748 1, delegates from the 13 local government areas of the state voted in the election that returned state officials of the party unopposed. Staying in the southeast, the Enugu State chapter of the PDP also conducted its state congress at the Michael Opara Square with the state governor as well as the former deputy president of Senate in attendance.
Over in Nassau Estate, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has conducted by-elections for the Nassau Central constituency at the State House of Assembly. The election is the first to be conducted by the electoral umpire during the COVID-19 pandemic and is expected to set the tone for the forthcoming governorship elections in Edo and Ondo states. In most of the polling areas visited, Channel's television observed that provisions were made for uh, personal safety. The general assessment is, uh, is, uh, is good, meaning that there is no much problem. The initial hiccups we had had been resolved. You know, it is human. In any human organization, anything that involves human, we expect some level of uh, hiccups. But these have been resolved early. And as you can see, everything is going normal. So there's no problem. Yes, including the turnout of voters. Peace, you can see the security people, they are on ground to maintain peace and order. And to security, the youth wing of the Southern Kaduna People's Union is asking the military to leave their communities in the face of growing insecurity in the area. Speaking during a protest in Abuja, the national youth leader of the union, Mr. John Isaac, said that the military has not done enough to help the situation. They are also demanding the creation of a separate state for Southern Kaduna. Clad in black. Young people from southern Kaduna carry placards with inscriptions stating their displeasure over the state of insecurity in their communities. Their grievance is that governments at all levels, according to them, have not done enough to keep them safe. The military should be withdrawn. Prayer number two is this. Agree with southern Kaduna today, it can be somewhere tomorrow. Uh, the, the south should come collectively and say no to this genocide going on in southern Kaduna. It is southern Kaduna today. Tomorrow it might be south. It might be southern Nigeria. So please we are calling on uh, Nigerians, irrespective of tribe, religion, or whatever, to come together. Let's fight this menace. It is actually out of hand. It is actually out of hand. Totally, totally, we are calling on the international community to please, as a matter of urgency, intervene in southern Kaduna issue. Our people are in refugee camps. They can't go to their houses. They can't live in the comfort of their homes. It's quite disheartening. We want to break away from Kaduna State. We want to break away because this thing keeps continuing. It's, it's, it's devastating. They also allege that their colleagues were arrested in Kaduna for protesting against the killings. They are still locked up right now. Our people are still locked up. Our young men, some were arrested this morning because they, are, they came out to say, to say to the government, enough is enough. This protest is supposed to happen in Abuja, Kaduna, and Lagos. And now I have people in Kaduna coordinating. And those that came out in Kaduna this morning were arrested. Every time there's an attack, it's our people who come out to defend themselves that get arrested. We've had enough. President Muhammad Buhari recently called for a review of the security architecture in the country in view of the developments in southern Kaduna and other parts of the country. But these youths believe more needs to be done. 
In the face of the current security challenges in the country, many including the National Assembly have called for the sack of the service chiefs. But the Ebony State Governor David Mahi is asking President Buhari not to replace the service chiefs but instead increase the military's funding and logistics to aid their performance. The State Governor made the call at the groundbreaking ceremony of the Nigerian Army Reference Hospital in Abakaliki, the state capital. Healthcare delivery will soon get a boost in the southeast, as the Nigerian Army says it's now set to build the Army Reference Hospital in Abakaliki, the Abonyi state capital. Governor Dave Umahi arrives for the groundbreaking ceremony at the Nkwagu Cantonment, where he inspects the Guard of Honor. Apart from fulfilling the Army's corporate social responsibility to the people, a representative of the Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Tuka Borutai, says the occasion is a demonstration of the Army's resolve to provide efficient health care to its personnel and communities in the Southeast. The Nigerian Army has decided to start the construction of a 200-bed capacity hospital to undo tertiary level health care for our troops and their families. The 200-bed capacity reference hospital that we are gathered for the groundbreaking ceremony is intended to be a state-of-the-art hospital that will meet international standard with best practices. The location of the hospital was carefully chosen for easy access to the civil populace in the whole southeast region. Governor Dave Umahi and other officials move to lay the foundation stone for the facility. A day out with the representatives of the army is certain to bring out issues about the institution that have hit the headlines in recent days, including calls to replace the service chiefs, a move Governor Umahi believes may not solve the lingering insecurity issues in the country. To disagree with the National Assembly, um, in my own view, about the change of uh, service chiefs. One thing I realize in this country is that we like change too much. You know, we want everybody to test, you know, every seat. That is not what we need at this crucial time of our security challenges. What we need is cooperation with the security agencies. But the focus of this event is the reference hospital, a project that's expected to boost the morale of troops and their families, as well as contribute to the development of host communities. Now, more Nigerians stranded abroad as a result of the coronavirus pandemic have returned to the country today. Among them are 87 who arrived at the Namdi Azikiwe International Airport, Abuja, following the evacuation from Sudan via Air Sudan. The arrival was announced via the social media handle of the Nigerians in Diaspora Commission, NIDCOM. Other flights that arrived today include Air Peace Flight 311 evacuees who also landed at the Namdi Azikiwe International Airport, Abuja, from the UAE, bringing the total number of evacuees from the United Arab Emirates to 2,353. Meanwhile, 325 Nigerians evacuated from the United States also arrived this afternoon via Ethiopian Airlines, the sixth evacuation flight from that country. The Niger state government has says that only schools that have gone through readiness checks and certified to be prepared for reopening will be allowed to resume for exit classes. At a one-day sensitization on the role of public and private school administrators ahead of the resumption, the state government also says all teachers and students must subject themselves to rigorous checks before they are admitted into the school's arena. Our correspondent Emperor Simon reports. Empty classrooms, doors padlocked, gates shut. This is the current state of schools in Niger State. Since the outbreak of COVID-19 in Nigeria, pupils and students have been at home for more than four months, 
and this has had a great impact on the education sector in the state. Now the state government has reached a conclusion to reopen schools for exit students, both in boarding and day schools, come 9th and 10th of August. But this comes with some caution, which is the reason for this sensitization workshop being held at the Justice Lake Bukutiki International Conference Center in Mina for cross-fertilization of ideas between the State Ministry of Education and school administrators from across the 25 local government areas. Ministry of Education, in collaboration with UNICEF, is carrying out the 2019-2020 school census. I therefore urge all our school administrators, both from the public and private school, to cooperate with us in ensuring that all our learners are counted. The school authorities the are given conditions for welcoming students. You do not need to touch surfaces because it is from having contact with surfaces that you sometimes, that we sometimes, you know, uh, without us knowing, touch our eyes, our noses, and uh, our mouths. Sometimes it could be owing to voluntary, involuntary actions. So you don't need to touch anything when you're washing your hand ex except the liquids that will be dispensed from the setup. The uh, assessors will come with the forms, check your school, look at all the requirements, have you met all the requirements or not, and they will give you a score. That score will determine whether your school will remain open or it will go back to, as it were, in the military language, closed. For the state government, the terms are non-negotiable. Terms the school representatives say they are ready to commit to. 297 schools are expected to open in Niger State on 10th of August 2020 for exit classes. The state government is optimistic that with this sensitization workshop, the safety of students, teachers and every other person within the school community will be guaranteed. From the Justice Idris Lake Bokutegi International Conference Centre in Mina, Empress Simon, Channels Television News. In Anambra State, the distribution of relief items donated by the Coalition Against COVID-19, CACOVID, a private sector-led organization, has commenced in Oka, the state capital. The items are to be shared to the 181 towns in the state, including all ethnic, religious and health challenge groups. Commending CACOVID for the gesture, the Deputy Governor of Anambra State, Ms. Anke Mokeke, who stood in for the Governor, said the donations will help many families and individuals cope with the harsh reality caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. The warehouse of the Anambra State Emergency Management Agency, SEMA, in Oka, is loaded with various food items donated to the government of the state, courtesy of the Coalition Against COVID-19, COCOVID, a private sector-led initiative, providing succor to those in need as a result of the pandemic. The arrival of His Excellency... It's a relief package welcomed by the state government and on hand to receive the items is the Deputy Governor Nkim Okeke, representing Governor Willie Obiano. To none of the indigent people. He is taken on a tour of the storeroom with bags of rice, boxes of noodles, spaghetti and other items. Apparently we are just discussing how the distribution process will take place in Anambra. How we are talking to all the uh, 181 communities. But we are also talking to individual groups like the Alsa community, the Yoruba communities, some NGOs will be reached out to. And he's saying that this is the first place, the first state that it has been done. So Anambra seems to be doing things differently. We are making sure that every person in this state is taught one way or the other. The single largest private public coalition... A representative of the donor group says the relief package is a simple way of identifying with the masses. United in concern and committed to the single purpose of being there for our people. We have raised billions of Naira in relief funds, provided access to emergency care for millions of people, and are now on the path to ensuring thousands of families avoid the harshest socioeconomic consequences of this pandemic. The, the, the items were officially handed over to the government of Anambra State, and then a flag of the distribution. Yes. Yes. I'd like to extend the state's government 
uh, profound appreciation. The appeal made to them for to commence distribution rather than wait until all the materials have been delivered was listening to. And that is why we're having this flag off. The 50 trucks load of food are the first batch of 83 donated to the Anambra state government, which says it will begin distribution right away while awaiting the arrival of the second batch. Now, if you are a resident of Lagos Metropolis, you may have noticed some men digging and laying cables in the earth in various parts of the city. No need to wonder anymore because it's part of a move to provide better and faster internet connectivity to residents. The project spearheaded by the Lagos State Government in what it calls its Unified Fiber Infrastructure Project is to enable telecommunication companies in the state to use the same fiber cables for their connectivity to drive the state's economy. The sight of men digging up the ground and laying fiber optic cables on major roads and some streets in various parts of Lagos State recently raised questions in the minds of many as to what is going on. Though such is not a new development around the city, this time it's with the direct involvement of the state government, whose aim is to unify the state's fiber infrastructure into a single cable duct. According to the Lagos State Government, a dig once policy is now being implemented to prevent the continuous destruction of roads, water pipes and other social infrastructure. We've also started deploying our first phase of the 3,000 kilometer metropolitan fiber optics. What that does is that all the telcos and all the PTUs can have fiber capability and once the fiber is there, your internet will be stronger, your communication will be stronger. The Lagos State House of Assembly on May the 14th, 2020, approved the unification of fiber infrastructure for telecom companies in the city, paving the way for the project. But what does this really mean for the telecommunications operators, internet service providers and consumers? The operators, as they are, will only put fiber infrastructure where they get the most economic return from it. So you see Leki, Koibi, I have um, Sue Leri, and some parts of Ikeja having fiber infrastructure. Alagbado, MJ, um, Ajegmule, they don't have fiber infrastructure, right? So with the Lagos State government investing in, in, this, in this infrastructure, what it means is that there's an equal opportunity to serve those we call underserved. It's a good thing as far as the economy is concerned, and it's a good investment by the Lagos State government. In 2013, the National Economic Council agreed to a uniform right-of-way charge of 145 naira per linear meter of fiber. But some state governments disregarded the resolution and increased their charges by over 1,200 percent, making it difficult for telecom companies to achieve the much-desired broadband access. With the new unified fiber infrastructure in Lagos, this could mean two things. One, an increase in the cost of broadband for consumers, or two, a reduction in the right-of-way fees. We don't even know what's, what's, going, what's happening. We don't know what the cost and the prices are. But it would have been best if we're saying this is going to replace the right-of-way, we're going to stick to the, 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 the um, Nigerian government, 145 naira per linear meter, and you don't have to spend money digging. You don't have to spend money bringing in your own ducts. The ducts are here. That saves us a huge amount of money. In the Nigerian National Broadband Plan 2020-2025, Harmonizing the processes for issuance of right-of-way permits at standard rates is one of the focus areas that will help the achievement of broadband penetration targets. While this approval by the Lagos State Government is considered a step in the right direction, there are, however, questions begging for answers. Will the plans by the Lagos Government be revealed only after the cables have been laid? Does this mean a removal, reduction or replacement of the right-of-way charges? Laudable as this project may seem, it remains to be seen how much consumers will benefit from it in terms of connectivity and cost. And now a former senator representing Ogun East in the 8th National Assembly, Mr. Buruji Kashomu, has died. 
the politician and businessman was set to have died from complications associated with COVID-19 at a private hospital in Lagos. The 62-year-old former lawmaker who was a member of the People's Democratic Party PDP is the latest high-profile casualty in the growing list of prominent figures in the country killed by COVID-19. Former Governor of Oyo State, Abiola Jimobi, and former Chief of Staff to the President, Abba Kiari, were among those that succumbed to the virus this year. Meanwhile, the Governor of Ogun State, Dakwa Biodun, has reacted to the passing of the former lawmaker, Senator Buruja Kashamu, who represented Ogun East Senatorial District in the 8th Assembly. In a statement by his Chief Press Secretary, the Governor says Mr. Kashamu's passing as one death too many and a devastating blow to the nation's political family generally. The Governor adds that he received the sad news of his passing today with deep pain and grief that words cannot capture. He says on behalf of his family, the government and the good people of Ogun State, he conveys the deepest condolences. He adds that his demise further diminishes the tribe of his close political associates, adding that he was a large-hearted politician, courageous fighter for whatever cause he believed in. The central bank has debited some commercial banks in Lagos. That's on Business News. Here's Tenya Lashimuali with the rest. Thanks, Millicent. Welcome to Business News. The central bank has debited a total of 600 billion naira from some commercial banks this week for breaching its cash reserves requirement in its latest removal of liquidity from the financial system. This comes as the money market ends the week with tight liquidity of 220.7 billion naira, and that's a 71.63% decline from 778.0 billion naira recorded at the start of the week. The CRR debit is used constantly by the CBN to prevent banks from coming to the FX auctions with lots of cash, as too much forex demand puts the financial regulator on the pressure. Meanwhile, inflows worth 56.78 billion naira are expected from Treasury bills and 29.78 billion naira from open market operation next week, as the CBN will be rolling over some maturing debt instruments. Members of the National Assembly have commended President Mohamedou Buhari for signing the amended Companies and Allied Matters Bill 2020 into law on Friday. In a statement released today, the lawmakers say the President's assent has completed the final stage in the legislative process for the formal reenactment of the Act repelling and replacing the 30-year-old CAMA law after many years of failed attempts. They explain that the amended CAMA bill is a key factor in a addressing na uh, national economic challenges and improving the legal framework for ease of doing business in Nigeria, while its final assent marks a key milestone in the harmonious working relationship between the legislature and the executive. Now, Nigeria's foremost financial service provider, First Bank, says it's partnering with financial technology firms in adopting the use of artificial intelligence in delivering tailored services to its customers across all platforms. Speaking during the Bank's FinTech 4.0 Summit held via webinar, Group Executive e-Business and Retail Products of First Bank, Chuma Ezerim, explains that the bank is operating an open banking data platform to drive digital inclusiveness of its customers. Technology is set to be changing the global financial services industry and Nigeria has not been left out. More reason why First Bank is organizing the Fintech 4.0 Summit tagged how blockchain and artificial intelligence will disrupt Fintech in Nigeria. Reeling out how the bank has leveraged technology to deliver tailored financial services to its customers, the bank's chief executive officer, Adeshola Adedutan, gives details of progress made so far. First Bank has become the foremost financial inclusion solution provider with over 9 million USSD active users, processing over 200 million transactions to date. Also, with more than 60,000 first money agency bank locations, we have to date processed over 320 million customers' transactions worth over 6 trillion naira 
on the first money agent network. How has this impacted on the untapped digital payments industry? The group executive, e-business and retail products of First Bank, Chuma Ezerim, gives insight on the processes aided by artificial intelligence. We have, you know, deployed AI, an AI-powered fraud and monitoring system that detects out-of-pattern transactions done daily by our customers and thereby prevent fraud. As I said earlier, we process over 90 transactions per second. So you can imagine the volume of transactions that we process on a daily basis. For investors to take positions in the fintech ecosystem, there's a need to develop a robust regulatory structure, which CBN's director, Payment System Management Department, Musa Jimo, so says is in the works. We would like to uh, create an environment where small companies that don't have the financial muscle to come and take license from central bank can also participate. I think one of the major hurdles that the small companies, the fintech, are facing is the, their financial capability to come to CBN and say, I want to come and take a license. With the increasing payment channels available to its customers, First Bank says it remains committed to take advantage of artificial intelligence to reach the under-tapped markets. The Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation says it has signed a head-of-terms agreement with China's National Offshore Oil Corporation and an indigenous oil production firm, South Atlantic Petroleum. In a statement released via Twitter, the NNPC explains that the execution of the pact signals the resolution of a tax dispute in all mine and lease 130 production sharing contract following the $2.3 billion acquisition of a 45% stake by C. CNNOC from Sepetro in 2006. Apart from unlocking over $510 million in gas revenues, the resolution and signing of the agreement terms between the parties will also enable the settlement of renewal fees for OML 130. The OML 130 consists of Apple and Egina fields, which have been producing since 2009 and 2018, respectively. The Executive Secretary of the Nigeria Investment Promotion Commission, Ms. Yoande Sadiku, has explained that 10 states of the Federation lack functional investment promotion agencies. This follows a survey conducted by the Commission. Speaking during a webinar organized by the Commission in Abuja, Ms. Yoande explains that 26 states, representing 72%, had functional investment promotion councils. The end. IPC boss also asked state government to set up functional investment promotion agencies in order to attract both local and foreign direct investments to their domains. And that's business news. It's back to Millicent for the rest of the news at 10. Thank you, Taniola. It's about two weeks now since the Senate adopted the report of its ad hoc committee, which investigated the alleged financial misappropriation in the Niger Delta Development Commission, NDDC. Now, following that report, a number of allegations have been made by both the NDDC and the National Assembly. In this next report, our correspondent Terry Kumi takes a look at the recommendations of the Senate committee. While the House of Representatives is investigating the Interim Management Committee of the Niger Delta Development Commission and is yet to arrive at a conclusion, the Senate, through its ad hoc committee, looked into the financial records of the Commission from inception, as well as an alleged misappropriation of 40 billion naira. The investigation stems from a motion by a senator from the region who describes the NDDC as a financial conduit pipe. Senate is worried further that there have been large acquisition of misuse of funds by previous management of the Commission, which portrayed the Commission as a financial conduit pipe, especially when the aspiration of the founding fathers have been forsaken. After several hearings and submissions from concerned parties like the Central Bank, Auditor General, Ministry of Finance, Governors of the nine NDDC states, as well as past and present management of the NDDC, among others, the Senate Committee came out with a 118-page report containing 17 recommendations. 
Congratulations. One of the strongest of those is for the reconsideration of Putin Development Commissions and the presidency for direct presidential oversight, and that the president should step down the interim management committee to allow for a properly constituted board. And while many call for the scrapping of the commission for failing to meet up with its mandates to the people of the Niger Delta, the Senate instead believes that submission of a quarterly and annual performance report by the NDDC to both houses of the National Assembly could help with accountability. The committee also called for a refund of 4.92 billion Naira payment made to staff and contractors in breach of procurement process including the 1.5 billion naira COVID-19 relief payment and a fraudulent 1.96 billion naira for Lassa fever kits, which the former acting managing director, Joy Nunier, had openly alleged and condemned. The most of the contracts in NDDC are given out to members of National Assembly, but no, you don't know about it. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. In drawing its conclusions, the Senate committee proposed investigation of alleged blackmail by the NDDC against members of the National Assembly, on the subject of procurement process. The subject matter has caused divided opinions on the authenticity of the National Assembly probe, which was made very evident during the hearing with the Minister of Niger Delta Affairs, leading to subsequent release of names of lawmakers alleged to have so far benefited from the NDDC contracts. While the country awaits the recommendations of the House of Representatives, attention is fixated on the forensic audit of the NDDC and what decisions the president will make. Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. In the UEFA Champions League, Barcelona and Bayern Munich have advanced to the quarter-final stage. Now, the Catalan giants Barca beat Napoli 3-1 at the Camp Nou with goals from Lionel Messi, Luis Suarez and Clement Longley to qualify 4 to an aggregate at the expense of their Italian opponents. At the Allianz Arena, Robert Lewandowski scored a brace, Ivan Perisic and Corentin Tolisso also got on the score sheet as Bayern Munich hammered Chelsea four goals to one to qualify 7-1 on aggregate. Thank you, Ayo. Now, protesters in Beirut have stormed government ministries during a demonstration over Tuesday's huge explosion that left at least 158 people dead. Police fired tear gas at stone throwing demonstrators. Sounds of gunfire was also heard from central Mataz Square. Many Lebanese are furious at the government's failure to prevent the explosion at a warehouse storing over 2,000 tons of ammonium nitrate. The material had been seized from a ship six years ago but never moved. The government has promised to find those responsible. Now, France has made face masks compulsory in all enclosed public spaces amid a fresh bout of COVID-19 outbreaks. Uh, masks were already mandatory in public transport, but from Monday, they must also be worn in busy outdoor spaces. France has recorded more than 200,000 infections and over 30,000 deaths since the start of the pandemic. Here's more on this and other developments on our COVID-19 global update. Parisians strolling along the banks of the River Seine or browsing open-air markets in Paris must wear a face mask from Monday after authorities impose new measures to curb a rise in coronavirus infections. The order, which applies to people aged 11 and over, covers busy outdoor areas in the French capital and will remain in place for one month. Over in Britain, People must now wear face masks in most indoor settings. This includes places of worship, museums, cinemas, banks and libraries. Algeria has announced it will further ease its coronavirus lockdown, including shortening an overnight curfew, lifting some travel curbs and allowing large mosques to reopen. And in Kenya. President Uhuru Kenyatta is encouraging tourists to return to the country, saying Kenya is safe and open for business. President Kenyatta says the country, which has recorded 25,837 cases, is ready to receive domestic and foreign visitors, and that he's satisfied with measures taken by the tourism sector to protect travelers from COVID-19. 
And the main news again. The All Progressives Congress today kicked off its campaign in Benin City ahead of the September 19 governorship election in Edo State, with the party leaders saying they are confident of victory in the poll. Also today, youths from southern Kaduna took to the streets to protest killings in their area. They said the efforts of security personnel to end the violence have not been good enough. And protesters in Beirut today forced their way into the country's foreign ministry as anger mounted over Tuesday explosion that left at least 158 people dead. That's the news at 10 tonight. Many thanks for watching. I'm Melissa from Walkham. Have a good night.